Any minute now, defense attorneys will get their final chance to make ex-Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort a free man. Prosecutors made their closing argument just a short time ago this morning. It took them some 90 minutes, and they methodically laid out their case. The prosecutor, Greg Andres, telling jurors at one point, quote, Mr. Manafort lied to keep more money when he had it, and he lied to get more money when he didn't. This is a case about lies. Cameras are not allowed inside that Alexandria, Virginia courtroom, but we have had reporters inside from start to finish detailing and dissecting every word. CNN crime and justice reporter Shimon Prokopes, he's been following this trial for us, including being inside there. Shan Wu, former fe federal prosecutor turned defense attorney. We should also note he previously served as attorney for Manafort's former business partner, Rick Gates. Uh, so Shimon, the, the, the final word from the prosecution here, emphasizing that word lies. Yeah, quite a number of times. And really, this is what this case has been about, right? Tax fraud, bank fraud, lies, lying on documents, lying in emails, lying to accountants, lying to tax preparers. And lying uh, for money. And lying for money, essentially. Yeah. Hiding money, mm -hmm. not wanting to pay taxes for money. But I think one of the more interesting things, and some of the probably more perhaps some of the more greater color from this closing yeah. argument, was how the prosecutors uh, treated Rick Gates, you know, at one point uh, telling the jury you don't need to like him, uh, you know, trying to deal with this issue of the fact that he had an affair, the fact that he was stealing from Paul Manafort. All of those obviously are going to be... pleaded guilty to lying. And pleaded prosecuted. guilty to lying and also pleaded guilty for his own uh, charges uh, relating to some of the Manafort stuff. The other thing I think that they made a point of, it's all about documents. You know, we mm. have all made a big point that Rick Gates is the star witness here. Well, it was interesting because prosecutors said, no, the star witness here is the documents. Look at the documents. If there's something you don't believe, if there's something you question about Rick Gates, all of that is supported by the documents. So clearly, that to them is an important part of this case. Uh, and the bank fraud is really an important part of this case. Because that's really where Paul Manafort uh, has the most exposure on, which mm -hmm. where he can really face some significant time on. Shen, if you can, help us handicap this case here now. Uh, you did have the unusual circumstances where the defense did not bring any defense witnesses, right. uh, close their case, and now they're going to make their closing arguments. Uh, is this an open and shut case for this jury? No, I don't think so. Not, not at all. And uh, it's always hard to handicap. But any white collar case with this amount of documents, uh, it's an uphill battle for the defense. Mm -hmm. Not that unusual for them not to put on a case. Uh, I think it shows a measure of confidence mm -hmm. that they think they've scored some points um, on cross-examination. They built some credibility for themselves. They promised the jury, we're going to show you that Gates stole, which um, at the time I thought was a bit of a bombshell. But they delivered on that. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, have the point that he had pled guilty to false statements. So I think they feel they've established some credibility. And they've made some points on cross-examination. Um, on the bank fraud in particular, there are some arguments that even though there may have been this notion of the quid pro quo, that it doesn't mean that Manafort actually submitted false information to the bank. So they've got some things to hang their hat on. I think that's why they didn't present a defense. I wonder if what they're going to do here is give the jury the tax fraud charge and say, yeah, he committed these tax right. frauds, but then really hammer on the bank fraud. Because like I said, I think that's where he has the most exposure. Mm -hmm. And there is some argument to be made, certainly under the law, right. certainly to the jury, that perhaps the prosecutor, prosecutors here did not meet their burden of proof. The tax fraud, I think he's going to have a hard time with. Yeah. Shan, yeah. on the bigger issue of, of the, the broader focus of the Mueller investigation, Russian interference in the election, it came out in the trial, reaffirmed, uh, I was there last week when uh, Gates uh, didn't reveal but confirmed he'd been interviewed by the special prosecutor, his team, some 20 times. Uh, that investigation's still ongoing. Right. Do we have a sense of Gates' importance to Mueller's investigation on the Russia portion of this probe? Um, we don't from what's come out publicly here. I mean, I think we can infer his importance by the fact that he got a very generous plea offer mm -hmm. here. Um, but I think we've seen little little hints that there's a lot of debriefing that's gone on. You know, we've, we've seen some of those examples times. come out. Right. You know, 20 times is a lot of time to spend with the prosecutors. Yeah. And they don't waste <laughs> their time. And, and, and that's what's key is, is that he's cooperating. He had a lot of charges against him, Gates to get that cooperation deal with the promise, it appears, of just pro probation, not, not jail time. And if the prosecution says they didn't really need Gates to convict Manafort, mm -hmm. does that then presume that he is cooperating on the other issues under investigation and providing value? Right. Um, generally, 
The prosecution is not going to give someone a good cooperation deal unless they feel it's valuable. And you know, I'm not speaking from anything confidential mm -hmm. or, or privileged, but that's just the way that it goes. And it's interesting, in the Manafort trial, there's this atmospheric that it's possible there's a jury nullification issue going on where they might think, you know, he did so many wrong things and they've given him such a good deal that maybe it's not entirely fair to Mr. Manafort. And sometimes juries will go that route, or you really only need one person to go that route, of course. Right. Uh, it's uh, one, one person who doesn't believe it meets the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. Shannon Shimon, thanks very much. Among the mountain of evidence in the Paul Manafort trial is an email exchange with Jared Kushner, President Trump's advisor and son-in-law. Manafort emailed Kushner recommending a bank chairman for Secretary of the Army. At the time, that bank was providing millions of dollars in loans to Manafort. The email also included two other recommendations for possible Trump appointees. Kushner responded, quote, on it. There's no indication the Trump team in the end considered those suggestions or that Kushner was aware at the time of those millions of dollars in loans to Manafort. Democratic Congressman Jim Himes of Connecticut, he's a member of the House Intelligence Committee, and he joins us now from Stanford, uh, Connecticut. Thanks very much, Congressman, for taking the time. Good afternoon, Jim. So that email there was, was an example of Manafort's continued influence or perceived influence uh, with, with the Trump administration because three months after he left as chairman, he felt he had the, the influence at least to request a job for his banker. Uh, how concerning is that to you? Well, it, it's, it's ugly. It's very ugly. I mean, you know, the American people should have the confidence of knowing that their secretary of the army or their undersecretary of commerce didn't get that job because he wanted to, he was willing to extend a loan to Paul Manafort. That's not the way government should work. And it, and it just really, I mean, talk about the swamp not being drained. Uh, it is the ultimate in influence uh, trading. Now, no surprise, right? No surprise. This is an administration. Uh, that sort of makes a hobby of influence trading, and, and um, so I'm not surprised by it. But again, it's just further example of the reason why the American people uh, have uh, record low regard for Washington, D.C. Uh, we're, of course, uh, witnessing a continuing public assault by the president and his allies on the special counsel, the investigation. Just a short time ago, the president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, he had some more particularly pointed words from Mueller uh, about uh, this probe, and, and I, I'm going to quote him here. He told Bloomberg uh, the following, if he doesn't get it done in the next two or three weeks, he's speaking about Mueller here, we will just unload on him like a ton of bricks. Write the damn report so we can see it and rebut it. W what is he threatening here uh, to unload on the special counsel who was appointed, we should remind viewers, by a deputy attorney general appointed by this president? What is he implying there? Well, uh, you know, I mean, my God, so much to unpack there. First of all, uh, the president has been unloading on Bob Mueller, uh, you know, a Vietnam War hero respected by pretty much everybody for over a year right now. So I don't quite know what he means by we're going to unload. I mean, we're at the uh, tail end of uh, a year plus of the president and the president's people doing all they can to delegitimize Bob Mueller, to delegitimize the FBI. And this, this has one objective, Jim. The objective is that when Mueller comes out with his report, which I anticipate he will do in due course, uh, whenever he thinks that justice uh, is served by releasing that report, not whenever Rudy Giuliani or Donald Trump wants it to come out, um, he will come out with a report that the White House will, over the course of a year and a half, have delegitimized in the eyes of some minority of the American population. That's what's happening yeah. here. But, you know, the American people ought to scratch their head and say, wait a minute, what other subject of an investigation gets to decide when the prosecutor wraps up their case? You know, the president is not above the law, and neither is his attorney. Mm. I wonder, the president has been per per perpetuating this attack on Mueller for, for so many months. He's made a lot of veiled and not so veiled threats against the special counsel, against uh, his attorney general, Jeff Sessions, etc. But he hasn't pulled the trigger on any... I mean, he could, he could fire uh, Jeff Sessions. He, he could fire the deputy attorney general. We know from our own reporting that he's, he's had a lot of internal pressure not to take that step. In light of how long he's done this without actually moving, do you think this is more for public consumption and that these are, in the end, Empty threats from the president? 
Yeah, look, at the end of the day, the recourse against the president is political, right? I know we have a long conversation of the legal intricacies of whether a sitting president can be indicted. The bottom line is that that's never been tested. And so the answer to this question of is Donald Trump in, in trouble is political. And so, therefore, if his base believes, as they do today, because of his uh, Donald Trump's throwing mud at Mueller, at the FBI, at the Department of Justice, if he believes that, that, that those entities are corrupt and that Bob Mueller despite all of the evidence and the many convictions and the many guilty pleas and the many indictments, is somehow serving the interests of Hillary Clinton, which is sort of insane on the face of it, given what happened prior to the November 16 election, um, you know, the president can uh, count on a number of Republicans to, regardless of what happened, this is a, remember, I can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, president, mm -hmm. the president can rely on Republicans to defend him, regardless of the fact pattern, because he has so delegitimized Bob Mueller. There's a new poll uh, from Quinnipiac University. They do some pretty good polling out there. It says that more than half of Republicans now agree with the president's assertion, alarming assertion, offensive assertion, that the press is the enemy of the people. Just 36% said the news media had an important part of our democracy. Now, among Democrats, very different numbers. Just 5% said uh, the media is the enemy of the people. But I wonder, as you look at these numbers, that's more than half of people who, who describe themselves as Republicans who say that the media is the enemy of the people, uh, language from an authoritarian regime. How alarming should that yeah, be? Yeah, right, right out of, I mean, you know who says that kind of stuff? Joseph Stalin said that yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, dictators say that kind of thing. And sadly, and I, and I really do mean sadly, I've got lots of terrific Republicans um, in my congressional district in Connecticut. Lastly, this just demonstrates the extent to which the Republican Party has abandoned all its principles, uh, whether that's fiscal responsibility, whether that's not supporting tariffs, you name it, being decent, um, and become really a cult of personality around Donald Trump. Um, and it's a really interesting question to ask yourself. What happens to the Republican yeah. Party post-Trump? What are my colleagues who gave up their, res their constitutional responsibility to serve as a check and a balance on the president of the United States? How are they going to answer for that uh, on, the, on the back end of Donald Trump's presidency? Congressman Jim Himes, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jim.